Welcome to the NERJ NYREJ podcast. I'm your host, Rick Kaplan. My guest today is Alex Madden of K Properties and Investments. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, Rick. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for coming on. You know, uh, 1031 is all, exchanges are always very popular, and you are uh, dealing with those. So tell us a little bit about the 1031 exchange and what's going on with it this year on 2023, because there's always little changes. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, well, let me um, let me uh, briefly just uh, kind of hit on the fact that uh, I am not a, a tax professional, uh, so definitely want to advise uh, all of our listeners here to, to go ahead and, and talk through the uh, the 1031 exchange and, and various tax implications with their tax team. Uh, CPAs and attorneys and whatnot. With that being said, uh, my company, K Properties and Investments, uh, we uh, typically help um, investors complete thousands of 1031 exchange transactions every year. Uh, and so that's uh, something that we're, we're certainly familiar with and uh, and can definitely talk through. But maybe I'll just start off with what is a, a 1031 exchange? And I, I think a lot of uh, real estate investors have, have heard about it. Um, you know, kind of heard that, hey, there's some some possibility that could defer some some tax and that sort of a thing. Uh, so the the 1031 exchange is named after uh, Section 1031 of the uh, tax code, and uh, it's it's often known as a like kind exchange. And and what that means is that uh, when you sell a piece of real estate used for business or investment purposes, and you follow a whole bunch of rules. And we'll kind of get into those. Um, but you follow those rules and you buy another property used for business or investment purposes, you can defer the associated taxes with that. So the the typical taxes associated uh, with the, the sale of real estate are going to be your federal capital gains, your state capital gains, your uh, depreciation recapture tax, the Medicare surcharge, and potentially the alternative minimum tax, depending on your tax bracket. So it can be uh, pretty hefty uh, for for a lot of real estate investors should they sell a property and not use a 1031 exchange. Uh, so probably the the most important rule uh, that you know that you you have with regard to a 10, 1031 exchange is that you must use a qualified intermediary, uh, also known as a, a QI or an accommodator. And uh, this is going to be a, a third party that is going to hold on to your funds uh, and, and uh, more or less enforce the various rules associated with the 1031 exchange. And uh, so it's very important that you do that. You, you cannot do a 1031 exchange without a qualified intermediary. Every once in a while, I'll have somebody give me a call and they'll say, I'm ready to do my, my exchange. I say, great. You know, how much is with your intermediary? And they say, what do you mean? I, 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 it's in my bank account. And it's like, oh gosh, you know, that's, uh, it, it's so painful because that's, um, you know, that's a taxable event at that point. Uh, once, once investors take uh, what's known as constructive receipt of the funds. So, so you must use a qualified intermediary. And, uh, and there's very, uh, very many, you know, large reputable groups, uh, you know, bought and insured and, and that sort of thing who, uh, you know, who are going to go ahead and, and fulfill that role uh, as a qualified intermediary. So let, let, let me just, so if they're qual qualified, it, it's fine. They can go through with the 1031. If they take the money and they put it in their bank account and don't have a qualified, is a mediator? Uh, a qualified intermediary is intermediary. is one, one of the, uh, the, the, the common names, uh, QI, qualified intermediary. Uh, and then accommodator is is a, a synonym there for all, they're also known as uh, accommodators. Okay, so they don't use that, and they go right into a bank account with the funds that they received. Now they are disqualified from doing any ten thirty one exchange. Correct. Yep. Yeah, it's very important to use a qualified intermediary. There's a number of other rules um, associated with the ten thirty one exchange, and um, you know you can be. You know, kind of coach through most most of those after the fact, after a sale. Um, but the the one thing that you make sure you get done before the sale is get set up with a qualified intermediary. Okay, that's a that's a good note <laughs> for people to take because uh, you know you don't you don't want to be in the position where you 
you think you're going through with the 1031 exchange and then you're disqualified. So exactly. They should, they should prepare this before they uh, even close on a transaction. Correct. Correct. I think uh, most qualified intermediaries uh, would appreciate, you know, as you're going under contract that, uh, that, that you get in touch with them. Um, you know, obviously there's going to need to be some coordination there as to, you know, getting the funds uh, from sale over to the qualified intermediary. Um, you know, I, I do work with some intermediaries um, that can can get it set up same day. You know, I've I've had the, the occasional circumstance where uh, somebody says, I'm closing today. They say, you know, <laughs> tell me about your intermediary. Right. And they and we kind of go through that song and dance. And I, you know, just stop everything. You know, let's get the intermediary set up. And and so uh, most of the intermediaries don't like doing that. But it's more important that, you know, that we get that set up. So now what would qualify for a 1031 exchange? I, I understand it's a like uh, type pro, uh, property, but as there exceptions, like uh, if someone has an, 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 a second home that they do use as a rental on occasion, could something that like that be used on a 1031 exchange as well? So it it very well could. Uh, there's there's a number of um, you know different areas that it would probably be best to consult uh, your your tax team and get the advisors of a of a CPA. Um, you know, but as a general uh, rule, if the property is used for business or investment purposes, not for personal use, um, then it it could be. Uh, you use for 1031 exchange. And then one of the common misconceptions uh, with the, with a like kind exchange is somebody says, well, I'm selling a rental. Does that mean I have to buy a rental? And, uh, and the answer is no, uh, you, you do not have like kind does not mean, uh, you know, rental for rental. Uh, it, it just means for business or investment purposes and for business or investment purposes. So if you're selling a rental. Um, you could go buy a, um, you know, apartment building, or if you're selling an apartment building, you could buy, you know, raw timberland or selling raw timberland, you could buy a gas station. Um, and, and what we do here at K properties and investments, and, and I'm sure we'll get into this uh, a little bit later, but, um, we, we help investors, uh, who are accredited investors purchase Delaware statutory trust properties. Uh, and, and that involves a, a fractional ownership of large investment grade real estate that's completely passive uh, and, and is in fact 1031 eligible. Um, so, and, and so that, that's something that we can get into, but there's a number of other 1031 rules that I think we should probably cover um, first that, that um, are, are really important to understand uh, at the point of sale, when the funds go to the qualified intermediary, this now starts a timer. Uh, so there's a, a 45 day identification window uh, in which uh, there, there's a number of different rules, uh, you know, that that kind of judge, uh, you know, how you can identify certain properties. Um, but in short, you have 45 days to to communicate to your qualified intermediaries the properties in which you intend to purchase, and then uh, you have 180 days from the point of sale to go ahead and complete that purchase. And so, you know, this is uh, one of the the I think you know the more stressful parts of a 1031 exchange is that you know there is a there's a timeline associated and uh, and and for it can be a relatively short timeline uh, for a real estate transaction as well as you know potentially for a large real estate transaction uh, so that's that's definitely uh, one of those things to consider ahead of time. Now I get this asked quite a bit from uh, people that I know that do home flipping. They're either flipping homes or they're flipping land. Uh, can that be used for a 1031 exchange? Because so, I don't think most of them don't use it. <laughs> right, right, right. And again, not not a tax advisor myself. Uh, I've seen that many of the intermediaries and, and the CPAs that uh, I've, I've rubbed shoulders with over the years have, have indicated that, uh, that, that that is not uh, 1031 eligible. And uh, and so, you know, I think it's it's worth kind of discussing why. But just as a as a third party observer, I've 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 kind of witnessed the same thing that you have, that that's that's generally not going to be 1031 eligible. Well, that's too bad, because a lot of them end up paying quite a bit of taxes on when they flip these homes. Uh, sure. 
and you know even though they they put it into another home you know so I, I, it's sort of on the same idea as well i i don't really need to go into it but you know it's on the same idea as buying a apartment building and buying another apartment building i guess sure sure no i uh i i understand the sentiment and and the logic is is sound on my end uh i guess we'll have to kind of consult with the irs and, and yeah. see you know what i mean Maybe somebody you, can get them to change that. Okay, you can call them. I don't want to call them. I don't like to. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. So let's get into the uh, DST uh, properties, because now you 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 were telling me earlier that you know someone has a ten thirty one exchange that they put together, and now they have to find some properties, and it you it could take a quite a bit of time if it's like a a big apartment complex or something like that. Uh, but you're saying that a DST uh, sales investments would be another option for them. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me, if you don't mind, I would love just to hit on a couple more rules on the 1031 real quick, because uh, I sure. think it'll, it'll help uh, explain, you know, why what things are certain ways in, in the DSTs. Um, but in, in short, um, the, another one of the rules is that you must purchase equal or greater value from what you sold. So let's say, you know, you, you sold a million dollar property. Um, you would want to go and, and purchase at least a million dollars worth of real estate. Uh, and, and so if an investor has a mortgage on their property, that will typically involve replacing that debt. So on that same million dollar property, let's say they've got a $500,000 mortgage. So the property sold. $500,000 is going to go to the bank, uh, and then $500,000 is going to go to the qualified intermediary. Now, with that $500,000 at the qualified intermediary, they now have 45 days to uh, identify their replacement, 180 days to purchase, but they must purchase at least a million dollars worth of real estate. So um, that would mean that they either come out of pocket with $500,000, which most people are not going to do. Um, most people are going to replace their debt. Uh, which is to say, take on another mortgage, uh, and that's that's something that uh, we'll kind of get into with with the DST is very easy to do, uh, but important to realize uh, on on any 1031 transaction. Another really important one to realize is that uh, you must spend all the money. So uh, it's not as though you can have you know in our same example there 500 go uh, to to the qualified intermediary, and then you you know you use uh, 200,000 as a down payment and go buy a million, and then you pocket 300,000. Uh, that's that's not permissible. You must use all those funds. Uh, and then you must purchase with the same entity that you relinquished. So if you if you sold a property in your own name, you sold a property in a trust, you sold a property in an LLC, whatever that is, you want to purchase with the same entity that you relinquished. And uh, and so that's something that uh, you know that we can get into here with with the DSTs. Um, and and that's part of why they're they're so popular. But now uh so we're clear that person that has that $500,000 that has to reinvest it has to be in another in, uh, investment property cannot be in a, a, like a summer home or something on that idea. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, a lot of times, you know, somebody will give me a call and say, I'm selling my rental. I want to go buy, you know, a, a, a beachfront property that I've always wanted on the coast of Florida. And Unfortunately, uh, if you know if that's going to be something for used for personal use, that won't qualify uh, as that uh, business or investment purposes. Now, I you, you're talking about some of the rules, but isn't there a rule about the capital gains on inheritance when you do the 1031 exchange? So uh, you you may be referring to um, the the step up in basis that uh, that typically comes at you know at an owner's passing. And, uh, and so in, you know, my understanding of, of the current tax code is that uh, at an owner's passing, their heirs are going to receive what's known as a step up in basis. Um, and, and so uh, effectively what that means is all of the, the various taxes that uh, an investor had deferred over the course of their lifetime, the next generation would not be liable uh, for those taxes. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's one of the things that makes real estate a very um, you know, effective wealth transfer tool from generation to generation. So overall in 2023, they haven't really changed much of the rules uh, for 1031. So they, they, 
they did not change uh, much of the rules. Uh, I think we we all may remember uh, at the time, uh, candidate Biden and then later President Biden um, indicated that uh, there was going to be some potential changes around the periphery of the the 1031 exchange about you know, who could who could do a 1031 exchange, the amount of tax that could be deferred, uh, and and some other uh, potential uh, rules and changes that were suggested. Um, now this. Uh, never actually made it to the uh, to the floor, to my knowledge of of, uh, of legislation. I, uh, from my understanding, is uh, it never made it out of committee. However, this did create a lot of stir within uh, the the real estate industry, uh, and and at least from our perspective, um, you know, we're we're pleased to say that um, there was no meaningful changes associated with a 1031 exchange. But it is worth noting that uh, the, I believe it was in 2021, potentially 2022, but the 1031 exchange uh, celebrated its centennial, uh, as in it had the, the like kind exchange had been around for a hundred years. Uh, and so it's something that uh, has lasted uh, numerous, uh, you know, regulatory challenges as, as politicians have kind of considered changes around the periphery. Uh, however, you know, with, with a hundred years under the belt, we're cautiously optimistic uh, that it's it's going to continue, and I think um, you know the a lot of the rationale there is that there's a lot of economic good that comes around liquidity in the real estate markets, and and the perception would be that if the the like kind exchange uh, was substantially modified or done away with, that that liquidity may stop, as in people may may stop selling, and and I think we could all imagine you know the the ripple effects that that might happen there, particularly around realtors and brokers and attorneys and title companies and uh, and contractors and you know all of the various um you know even publications that are in the real estate sector right if if transaction volume was really to stop um and and the 1031 exchange is a a meaningful um lubricant within the the real estate industry well actually it was it was good for all of the people in the 1031 exchange industry when they were talking about all this. And then all of a sudden everyone's starting to rush to try to make 1031 in transactions because they didn't know what the rules were going to do in 2023. So sure. Yeah. They put a lot of money in your pocket. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a, I mean, I, I think a lot of factors have contributed to, to the state of the real estate markets, uh, including, you know, substantially available um, cash. You know, we saw historically low interest rates. You know, coming out of the COVID pandemic. Uh, so I think you know most real estate investors uh, are are going to look at you know the value of their real estate and you know, what's happened to it in the last two three years and uh, and say, wow, that was some meaningful appreciation. At least that's what we've seen across the country. And I think a lot of investors, uh, you know, looking at that uh, some, you know, very substantial jump and in value associated with the real estate combined with some regulatory uncertainty. I think a lot of them said, yeah, I think now's the time to, to go in and, and, and look at, you know, maybe cashing in on, on some of my, my unlocked equity here in this property and, and maybe reinvesting in one or more properties. Now, as far as location, you sell a property in Massachusetts and you find an investment property in Florida for the, under the 1031 rules you can you can do that you don't have to purchase the same in the same area or the same state correct yep yep um so anywhere in in the united states uh as long as you're selling uh 1031 eligible property and buying 1031 eligible property uh the location is is not a uh, a factor in in its eligibility so what happens if someone can't find it in 45 can they 45 days, can they go for an extension on that or that's it? It's done. Yeah. So that's, that's the real conundrum, right? Uh, is that, is that 45 day, uh, identification window? Um, and so that can really create a, a lot of stress. Uh, and that's why a lot of investors like, um, you know, what, what K properties uh, has to offer with, uh, the, the Delaware statutory trust or, or the DST. And, and so these are, uh, shelf ready, um, products and and I'll, I'll kind of break that down, but I think it's worth noting that a a Delaware statutory trust is just a legal entity. It's uh, these are not properties located in the state of Delaware. 
Um, it, to, to my knowledge, there has never been a, a Delaware statutory trust uh, in the state of Delaware. I'm, I'm sure somebody will be able to point out one, but uh, but the point is is that they're they're not typically in Delaware. Uh, they're they're typically all across the country, and um, and so what's different about a, the entity of a DST versus, for example, an LLC or a partnership or uh, or a trust, you know, something like that, is that uh, the the Delaware Statutory Trust allows for uh, the investors to purchase a percentage of the trust, known as a beneficial ownership or beneficial interest in that trust, and the trust is on title for the real estate. So I'll give you I'll give you a for example here. We may have an investor, uh, like you said, in, in Massachusetts, and uh, and they're selling a property. And, uh, and they want to uh, get into passive investment grade real estate, we may have a, a Delaware statutory trust, uh, say 500 unit apartment building in, uh, in the state of Florida. Now, one important thing uh, about these DSTs is that they are only available to accredited investors and accredited investors are typically described as those having a net worth of $1 million or more, not including their primary residence. Uh, but for those who who qualify as accredited investors, um, they may not be able to buy the whole 500 unit apartment building in, in Florida. However, uh, they might be able to go ahead and buy a piece of it. And they might be able to buy a piece of an apartment building in um, you know Virginia. And they might be able to buy a piece of a FedEx uh, distribution center in Kansas. And, uh, and so they could build out their own little portfolio of 1031 eligible properties that are all professionally managed and uh, and theoretically uh, receive that potential mailbox money that that I think many investors are are looking for. So that I mean, it sounds great. <laughs> you know, the, you have all these properties that you own a little piece of the pie. The right. only the only issue is when uh, you want out, what happens? Can you get out, or do you have to wait until the property is sold? Yeah, great, great question. So I think there's there's a number of reasons why investors uh, like DSTs, and and we touched on some of them. There's a few more that, that investors like uh, as well, uh, but there are some reasons that investors don't like DSTs, and and I think you you've kind of touched on them. Um, you know, one is this issue of liquidity. Uh, now, uh, every DST is going to have a business plan associated with that, and and there is a trustee of the Delaware Statutory Trust. Uh, who is managing that property, uh, who is looking uh, for the best interests of the various investors, and they are looking to operate in accordance with the published business plan. And so uh, we found that uh, historically, many DSTs are, are sold within a five to seven year time frame. That's a, that's a very common business plan. Uh, now, some could be shorter, some could be longer. Uh, we've seen some go for, for two years or sometimes even less. Um, but they're the the trustee of the Delaware Statutory Trust. He's going to be looking to to operate to that business plan. And so I always tell uh, accredited investors that uh, they should plan to stick with it for the full life of the business plan. Uh, that that business plan was put together to maximize the the potential returns. And uh, should an investor jump out early, um, then they're they're potentially foregoing you know some of the the potential um, you know, profits there in that business plan. Now, with that being said, there's also no prohibition on selling early. Uh, so there's not like a, a lockup period or, or a prepayment penalty or, or something like that. Um, however, it, it does bear noting um, that there's a, a very limited secondary market uh, for these kinds of transactions. As, as I'm sure most investors realize, there's no MLS out there for, uh, for DST properties. Uh, and it's a very restricted buyer pool in that uh, investors uh, must be accredited investors to purchase. So, uh, you know, one of our clients may uh, may be interested in, in selling to their neighbor who uh, who is look interested in buying their ownership interest in in a DST, but their their neighbor might not be an accredited investor and therefore would not be able to purchase. So, uh, limited liquidity is uh, is a, a potential consideration there. Investors should. Should plan to stick with it for the full life of the business plan, and then we touched on the trustee of the Delaware Statutory Trust, and it's kind of two two sides of the same coin, where uh, we've got a you know many real estate investors they 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 want to be passive, but nobody wants to give up control, right? 
And, uh, and so those are kind of two, two sides of the same coin and K properties. You know, we, we work with, with many of these different groups who put together Delaware statutory trust properties. Uh, we've known and worked with them for, for many years at this point, familiar with their strengths and their weaknesses. And uh, we have a very intensive due diligence process that, uh, that will walk, uh, you know, these various DSTs and various um, trustees of the Delaware statutory trust through in order to, to make recommendations to our clients. So they'll be getting a disbursement uh, monthly or quarterly or whatever is set up uh, from that property, even though, uh, you know, it's not, they don't have full ownership. Uh, they just, they'll, they'll still get their disbursement, right? Right, right. So the the the, the potential distributions are uh, are in accordance with an owner's uh, percentage ownership of that property. So, uh, for example, if, uh, if there's a 1% uh, ownership, then uh, then they would be entitled to you know the that uh, that amount of the various income, uh, that amount of the various potential tax benefits of of owning real estate, um, you know things like interest payment deductions and um, you know expense write offs and, and and those sorts of things, um, as well as um, you know their their um, percentage of any potential appreciation when the property is sold. Uh, so it is it is being managed uh, on on their behalf. Um, but, you know, and, and I think an, an important thing to realize is, you know, some of the, the potential tenants on this are, are things like, uh, like FedEx distribution centers, Amazon warehouses, uh, you know, larger, uh, institutional type properties. Um, but I have, I have many clients ask me, well, is it a guaranteed payment? And I think this is something that we all kind of intuitively understand about real estate. You know, it's, it's, this, you know, the, the DSTs are, are the same as, as any other kind of real estate. Uh, when it comes to guarantees, right? And and what I mean by that is, um, you know, the tenant has to be there paying in, in order to to receive that distribution. So, you know, can I guarantee you uh, that FedEx is is going to be in business forever? Um, no, I, I I can't personally guarantee that. Uh, however, you know, over the next five to seven years, uh, you know, for for a number of different reasons, believe that's that's probably unlikely. Uh, so as long as you know FedEx is there operating, uh, is is paying out that uh, that rental distribution. Um, you know, then it'll be there to uh, to be distributed to the investors. Well, they should know that nothing that you invest in is a hundred percent guaranteed on, in anything. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So now, what happens now? They they say they had uh, five million dollars from a ten thirty one. They invest in all these different DSTs, and one of them sells and they get that cash uh, back from that one, but they initially invested $5 million in additional, you know, all different uh, DSTs. Now, how can, can they do a 1031 with just that portion? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we, we t kind of touched on some of the reasons why investors don't like DSTs. Some of the reasons that investors do like DSTs uh, is is this one that you're talking about right now, which is diversification? Uh, you know, in, investors might have a, a substantial portion of their net worth tied up in in just one property right now, and you know, God forbid something happens to that property, um, you know, that's uh, that's some real concentration risk of their wealth. Uh, so when a an investor does a, a 1031 exchange, in, you know, in our example here, uh, out of a, a five million dollar property, and let's say that they invest in five different properties for a million dollars each. Um, now they've they're they're further diversified. They're accessing potentially higher quality assets than than they might be able to on their own, the passive nature of these investments. Uh, but but to your point, um, they have they have virtually every option um, when when this property is sold that they did going into it, uh, which is to say, they could pay their taxes if they wanted to. Uh, most most investors do not want to do that. Uh, <laughs> And and so uh, they could do the 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 1031 exchange uh, again. Uh, they could go into a property if they wanted to get back into active management. They could go ahead and 1031 exchange uh, back into active management. However, uh, most of our clients uh, are going to go ahead and do another 1031 exchange into DSTs. And uh, and and I think one of the one of the reasons that people really like DSTs is as for what we call that lifestyle change, where you know they can defer the associated taxes. And and spend time, you know, at, at other ventures, maybe business or with kids or grandkids, and and that sort of thing. So the DST is a 
a, definitely a great benefit. Uh, and, you know, the, the you talk about guarantee. The risk factor is probably fairly low because of the high quality of tenants and the uh, type of properties they are, I would think. Sure, sure. And, and you know, as you can imagine, uh, we've evaluated many thousands of, of DSTs uh, over the years. And, and so there's, you know, there's a broad spectrum of, of risk associated. Uh, I think things to consider um, is, is the classic risk versus reward trade-off. Um, you know, somebody who is uh, really trying to seek, uh, you know, the, the top of the top of the top, uh, you know, potential yield on an investment, um, they, they may hit it out of the park, right? Just like if you're going to go buy a, you know, a class C or a class D war zone apartment building, um, you know, you, you could buy a phenomenal investment, you know, it's, <laughs> but you could also uh, buy a terrible investment. And, and so, you know, it's that, it's that classic uh, risk versus reward uh, trade-off that, uh, that we, that we really try and talk investors through. However, uh, DSPs were 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 not ever looking at those Class C, Class D war zone apartments. Uh, we're looking at you know typically your your Class A newer construction type apartments, uh, Class B you know maybe ten year old uh, type apartments with some potential for value add. Uh, things like uh, light industrial, uh, sometimes retail, sometimes office, uh, self storage, medical properties. Uh, those those kinds of uh, of assets that are a little bit more down the the middle of the fairway and and frankly we're we're not swinging for the fences on on the DSTs. I I tell a lot of investors that you know this is those this is uh, the the kind of investment that that might be uh, available for for those you know going from the wealth accumulation phase of life maybe into the wealth preservation phase of life and you know we have some some different DSTs that are designed, uh, you know, more for, for uh, principal protection, you know, as we mentioned, uh, obviously nothing is, is ever guaranteed, but, you know, if you have a, for example, an Amazon warehouse uh, that is, has no debt, no mortgage on the property uh, with a long-term lease, uh, there's, there's, there's risk associated, right? But, you know, I think we've mitigated a, a number of risks just by owning the property with no bank involved. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds too good to be true, but it's it's true that that would be the case in a situation like that. Sure, right. But but I can understand. You know, someone uh, has been in the industry for quite a long time. They own a, quite a few properties, and they decide, you know, it's time. I want to get out, and they, you know, start selling off properties. This is a perfect way out. Absolutely, absolutely, and and you know that's that lifestyle change that, uh, that I think we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people who have you know owned and managed their properties sometimes for decades, sometimes the majority of their life, and and they just say, "Gosh, I'm just tired of those terrible teas," you know, that that everybody talks about the toilets, tenants, and trash, and and they think, you know, man, my property has just uh, you know appreciated so much over the years. Uh, I I just I it would be such a painful tax bill. I don't want to give you know, potentially a third, potentially half of, of my sales price away to Uncle Sam, well, the, the DSTs can can provide a, a meaningful option there. And especially for our investors uh, up here in, in New England, you know, I think that it, it can be difficult to, to get, um, you know, properties that are, um, you know, that, that have meaningful cash flow associated with them uh, in comparison to some other parts of the country. And, you know, while, uh, for example, the, the Dunkin' Donuts headquarters uh, uh, property outside Boston, that was a DST. Uh, we've, we've done some in, in New York, um, in, uh, in New Hampshire, obviously Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, uh, and, and some other states. I would say the, the vast majority of, of the DSTs that we, uh, that we have available are, are usually going to be in, uh, in what, what I kind of reference as the, the smile states. You know, if you picture uh, a smiley face uh, across the United States. It's going to be the the Southwest over the Southeast, and then up there in in the Midwest. And uh, and right now, I think that's just where a lot of the the opportunity is in comparison to you know what you can get in in like the Boston market. And and I think uh, a lot of investors are are going to be uh, particularly in the DST space, you know, open to you know going where there's uh, you know there's there's uh, some some more potential value there uh, rather than you know, something that's, uh, that, you know, a little bit lower potential management intensive and closer to home. 
Well, before I go, I want to get into your background before we end the show. Uh, but I have one last question about DSTs, and that is, what is the difference between that and a wreath? Yeah, well, there's there's some definite uh, meaningful differences, uh, but between a DST and a wreath. Um, so, in in short, uh, you cannot do a 1031 exchange into a REIT. Uh, so, a REIT is a real estate investment trust. Um, now. There is, and, and this is, um, you know, I, I can cover it briefly. It could be a, a, a topic for another uh, podcast. Uh, but the the 721 exchange is um, is a another tax deferred exchange into a REIT. And most investors are, are never going to come across the 721 exchange. Uh, this is really, you know, big, big real estate kind of Wall Street type uh, in investments. And uh, so a, a REIT might have, um, you know, hundreds or, um, you know, thousands of properties in it, maybe uh, potentially billions of dollars of, of, of assets under management and ownership in a REIT is, uh, is, is designated in shares. And so uh, investors uh, would have shares in a REIT. Um, but again, you can't 1031 in uh, to, to a REIT. So uh, if, you, if you are looking to get into a REIT, um, you know, there's, there's a, a number of different potential options, um, but it would typically involve um, going into something like a Delaware statutory trust uh, for a number of years. And then if the REIT buys that Delaware statutory trust, investors may potentially have the option of uh, doing a 721 tax deferred exchange into a REIT. Uh, so I would definitely advise you to, to kind of talk to a professional. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but uh, the you know one of the, the big differences is uh, DSTs is, is ownership and real property uh, that is 1031 eligible. And, uh, and and REITs, uh, you're, you're owning shares uh, in, a, in a trust that owns many different properties. Okay, well, that, that's good to know. Uh, because, you know, what, as you were talking about the DSTs, I'm, trying, I'm thinking about how much more, how much different is this from the REITs? And, you know, I didn't think about it as she is, but... You're correct. It is she is in, in the read as and this is ownership. So uh, right. And that makes it why it can be used as a 1031 because you have an ownership in it. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, and you know, the the, the DSTs and, and other kinds of real estate is what the IRS calls quote unquote real property, which uh, which is why it has that that 1031 eligibility. Okay. Well, that's uh, great information. Now, Alex, let's talk about your background because that this this is a lot more interesting than 1031 <laughs> exchanges, <laughs> to be honest with you. You're a <laughs> past Army Ranger and you served yep. in and and you served in Afghanistan for a, a multiple tours, correct? I did. I did. Yeah. Yep. Well, first, thank you for your service. Uh but thank uh, you. you know, how do you go from there to get into 1031 exchanges? <laughs> Right, right. It's good, almost good yeah, what, you know, kind of like a war zone, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it feels that way sometimes, yeah. although uh, that that's just because I've been out of Afghanistan for a while. But um, <laughs> so I I will say that uh, I I did uh, ROTC uh, down at uh, at Salve Regina in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, and so I I was uh, just studying my undergrad there. Uh, went uh, did. That was a satellite of uh, ROTC through University of Rhode Island, and so you know here here in New England, uh, you know raised and and then eventually uh, commissioned as an infantry officer, um, went down to to Georgia, and uh, I, I like to say I went back and forth uh, to Afghanistan for from between Georgia and Afghanistan for for about five years, um, and so I went through Ranger School, did uh, did that whole um, you know fun uh, summer camp there. We, we we called it the the Benning School for Boys down at Fort Benning, Georgia, and um, and then went uh, did my my first deployment uh, in the conventional army uh, over uh, in in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and in southern Afghanistan uh, as as an infantry officer and platoon leader, and uh, came back uh, to the United States. Uh, tried out for and was uh, accepted to the 75th Ranger Regiment, and uh, and went back to uh, Fort Benning again, uh, and then went back to Afghanistan again. Uh, this time, uh, ultimately, uh, was the um, the chief of staff for one of our special operations task forces uh, there in uh, in Kabul, in in the capital city, 
and uh, eventually uh, came back and, to, to the United States. And, and as I, I like to tell my wife, uh, you know, it, it hit me, you know, I'm, 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 I'm never going to get married if I keep doing this. And, uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, what got out of the army and went to uh, Washington DC and uh, actually was, was set up on a blind date with my wife, uh, which I'm, I'm happy to say we've, uh, we've, we've got a, uh, a young daughter uh, in our family now as well. Um, but I, I got a job working for uh, KPMG, uh, which is a, a larger management consulting company uh, across the United States, and uh, started doing uh, single family and multifamily consulting. And uh, so I was was helping, um, you know, larger entities, you know, look for how they could increase efficiency in the single family and multifamily space and uh, potentially be you know, more economically viable. And uh, and so that kind of started uh, the the uh, the real, uh, you know, reflection on, you know, real estate, the value of real estate and uh, as well as, you know, KPMG's background is, is in accounting. And so always looking for. You know potential tax benefits, and and then you know heard about this amazing thing called the 1031 exchange, and uh, and so it was it, it was it was an amazing kind of pathway of of tax deferral there. Well, that uh, if anyone's interested, they can read it in Alex Madden's biography that he's going to write, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> the book will be on uh, store shelves next week, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Better get writing. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, it, you know, I always find it interesting how people go from that uh, kind of a career to any other kind of career that goes into the public sector, you know, you know, the uh, private se sector, I should say, uh, you know, because it's it's kind of a diff two different lifestyles, <laughs> you know. It is. It is. Absolutely. And uh, it, it certainly, um, you know, took a, a little bit of adjusting, you know, from going a at a high operational tempo with, um, you know, with, with the Rangers and, you know, special operations community uh, into, you know, more or less, uh, you know, working in an office building uh, all day. Um, but there, there come, it comes with trade-offs too. Um, you know, you, you, you don't have people trying to kill you either. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, it's not... Well, in some of the uh, real estate industry, <laughs> parts of it. It's, uh, yeah, people... it can feel that way. It can yeah. feel that way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it's I, I, I commend you. Great job. And, you know, with with the 1031s exchange, I mean, that's uh, that, that's always an important part of the real estate industry, our investors in general in real estate, because of uh, what, you know, how you have to play around with the taxes, you know, otherwise you couldn't get murdered right. with that. Right. Uh, it's uh, so. And both services, you were doing us uh, all, all the people, quite a bit of, uh, you know, goodness, I should say. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here to serve, and yeah. uh, and and I am, I am passionate about, uh, you know, tax deferral and and that sort of a thing. I, I think, um, it's, it's a phenomenal option for investors. Uh, every once in a while, I will, you know, come across a, a real estate investor who has never heard of the 1031 exchange. And and I, I I get all excited, you know. Gosh, let me let me tell you about this uh, because I think it's it's a it's a phenomenal tool to have in the toolkit. Um, and and for the right investors, you know, DSTs uh, really make sense. And and if it's if it doesn't make sense for you know for our our potential clients, we'll we'll tell them that as well. You know that hey, this isn't you know for X Y Z reason this this might not uh, be be the best option for you. But I I very strongly encourage everybody to evaluate the 1031 exchange because if you're selling you know business or investment real estate uh it's it's usually going to be the uh the the right move there for, from a tax deferral perspective and if someone wants to get a hold of you uh through the website what's the website address alex yeah absolutely so if you go on to uh, www.kpi1031.com and uh, go ahead and register then uh, you can get in contact uh, with the the K Properties team and access uh, our our full marketplace of DSTs. Yeah, plus they can look you up on that uh, website as well. I think you'll listen. absolutely. Yeah, yep. Go ahead and uh, and and meet our team. You know, happy to to work with any of your listeners. Uh, just just as you sign up, uh, just just write a note. Would would love to connect with Alex Madden, and uh, definitely we'll we'll be here to help out. Well, thank you, Alex. A lot of great information. A good story you have to tell. I appreciate that. 
And I wish you all the best on your your future career in the 1031 industry. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Rick. Uh, you know, I, I work with clients all across the country, but uh, New England native and, and love to work with uh, New Englanders here. So really, really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Well, thank you. And then we're talking with Alex Madden of K Properties and Investments. And you can find them at, uh, or you can find out more information at their website at www.kpi, is KPI, right? That's right. KPI1031.com? Exactly. That's, exactly. Okay. I'll, they will also be on, uh, you can listen to the show on Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Spotify, Buzzsprout, or you can view it on YouTube or the New England com slash videos, our, our website. I want to thank you all for listening. Have a great day.